For a long time in human history, it was sufficient to work with analog sizes. We had analog amplifiers and filters for audio and video, analog oscillators and mixers for radio and television, we even built analog computers for solving differential equations. With the invention of the transistor, followed by integrated circuits containing billions of them, a paradigm shift occurred. Suddenly it was possible to convert an analog value very quickly and very accurately into a digital one. The era of digital post-processing had begun. In this video we want to plunge into the wondrous world of ADCs and find out about some basic topologies. In our last video, we covered the most important errors we can run into when converting an analog value into a digital one. If you haven't seen it yet, it's worth to take a look in order to be able to follow this video. Today we want to give a first clue on what to look for in order to find the perfect ADC for a particular application. So before we get into detail with the implementation of some basic ADC topologies, we would like to summarize the most important parameters of ADCs. Two of the things we probably want to know first about our analog to digital converter is how accurately and how fast it converts an analog input signal into a digital output value. So the main two parameters to look for are resolution and speed. In datasheets, those parameters are typically denoted as the sampling depth which gives us the number of bits at the output, and the sampling rate, which gives us the number of conversions per second. Depending on the application, one might also be interested in the accuracy. Especially monotonicity and linearity are of great importance, as we have discussed in our last video. Another question is the input scaling. Does the ADC accept the same voltage range as the input signal has, or do we need to scale it up or down first? What does the digital output look like? Does the ADC give us a unipolar or a bipolar output, and in what format? There are several digital communication standards for ADCs and microcontrollers, like I2C or SPI. But there are even more practical things to worry about if we build a circuit containing an ADC. One of the questions that might arise is, what package do we have? What voltage supply do we need? Or where does the reference voltage come from? Is it internally created or do we need to provide it from outside? There are many basic things to think about in a standalone ADC and we could go into even more detail about other features that an ADC could offer. All this should only show that there is a reason why millions of different ADCs are commercially available. But if we sort them out and consider all the features we need, we might end up with only a few choices. To fully understand the upcoming chapter, you will need some basic knowledge about comparators, which we have covered in our video on operational amplifiers. If you want to refresh your knowledge before, we have put some links in the video description. Now it's time to get to know some topologies and we will start with the fastest one, the parallel or even a better name, the flash converter. With a simple flash converter, a conversion is carried out in a single step. The input signal is simultaneously applied to the individual inputs of n comparators. This also requires n uniformly distributed reference quantities. In this example, these are generated by a simple resistive voltage divider. The output signal is converted via a priority encoder to a binary code. The input of the priority decoder corresponds to the highest comparator activated by the input voltage. This circuit is only intended to illustrate the principle with which a flash converter works. Real ADCs do not work so clumsy. The circuit shown here nevertheless illustrates the problem of a flash converter. For a sampling depth, 
of only 3 bit, 7 operational amplifiers are needed. The number of comparators is generally calculated by 2 to the power of n minus 1. You can therefore certainly imagine that this design is not suitable for ADCs with high resolution. Just think of an 8-bit converter which would need 255 comparators and resistors. We would need plenty of space on our chip for so many components. We will definitely run into trouble with high input currents and input capacitances, as well as with the accuracy of our reference voltages, annoying DC offsets and so on and so on. Simple flash ADCs usually only have a resolution of about 6 bit, but with quite impressive sampling rates of about 100 mega samples per second. But even these ADCs can reach higher resolutions if we tweak the circuit a little bit and use a simple trick. Modified flash converters with names like subranging flash, pipeline flash or this half flash here appear much more often in practice. They consist of consecutive partial converters which divide the work. This has the effect that they have a certain delay or latency time. But this does not reduce the sampling rate. In this example, the analog input signal is first presented to a 4-bit coarse ADC. A digital-to-analog converter converts the result back into an analog value. The difference between this signal and the original input signal is presented to a second fine ADC, which splits the error of the coarse ADC into four bits. While this fine quantization is happening, the coarse ADC can simultaneously deal with the next input level. These converters can be built with even more consecutive ADCs that operate on the residue of the previous one. With this technique, we can build ADCs with up to 12 bits and sampling rates of some gigasamples per second. The only drawback is the latency at the beginning of the conversion. As you might already guess, it's again a matter of application. Latency might not be a concern in an oscilloscope front end or in some kind of radio application, but it is sure a disaster in fast digital control loops. There are a lot of other flash converter architectures, like folding and RF ADCs. But to go into detail on all of them would be well beyond the scope of this video. We rather want to look at another, a little slower, but very famous conversion technique. It's called successive approximation. An ADC, according to the classical successive approximation technique, sometimes also called SAR, determines the result of the conversion as we would measure an indefinite mass with a beam balance and a dual set of weights. Let us assume that we want to determine an unknown weight which is smaller than, let's say, 1 kg with a beam balance. To fulfill this task in the fastest way possible, we could address the problem in the following way. The first step is to choose a counterweight that is half the maximum expected weight, which is 500 grams. Now we observe the beam balance and notice, for example, that it does not sway. So we have to increase the weight and select an additional weight of half the previous one, which is 250 grams, next. Now the beam swings to the left. So we take away the additional weight and try again to put on half of the last one, which is 125 gram. If the beam does not swing this time, we leave the 125 grams on it and we add another 62.5, etc. etc. If we only use this technique long enough, we will eventually balance the scale and obtain the value for the unknown mass. This technique is also called binary search in the language of computer science. An ADC with successive approximation will do exactly that for as long as its resolution allows. Let's take a look on how it's done. The converter consists of a comparator, an n-bit digital-to-analog converter with reference voltage, 
and a logic circuit, also called SAR, for a successive approximation register. Since the input signal must not change during the entire conversion process, such a converter must be operated with an analog memory circuit, a so-called sample and hold stage. This ensures that the instantaneous value of the input voltage at the beginning of the conversion is available until the end. Let's take a closer look at this sample and hold stage. This input stage is often only a capacitor combined with two switches. The ADC starts the conversion process by closing S1. Now the capacitor, which usually has values of a few tens of picofarads, is charged by the input signal. It must be ensured that the output resistance of the input is low enough to charge the capacitor to the desired value in the acquisition time, which is only a few fractions of a microsecond. After this time, S1 opens while S2 is closed. During the conversion time, which is often in the range of a few microseconds, the capacitor keeps the input signal constant until the end of the conversion. Then the next cycle begins. Now let's get back to the full circuit and see what it does during the conversion time. Initially, all bits are usually set to zero. Then, beginning with the most significant bit, each bit in turn is set to logical one. At the beginning of the conversion, the comparator therefore compares the output of the DAC, whose input is temporarily set to one, with the input voltage. If the input voltage is larger than the output of the DAC, the bit is left as a 1. Otherwise, a logical 0 is written into the most significant bit of the register. This contribution of the most significant bit is retained in memory during further conversion. In the second step, the next less significant bit is set to 1 for testing purposes and the result of the comparison is observed. If a larger input voltage results again, a logical one remains at this position. Otherwise, a zero is entered in the second position of the memory and so on. After n clock cycles, the digital output in the memory is approximated to the input signal to an accuracy of n bits. The accuracy of the converter depends essentially on that of the internal DAC. Formally, the system can be regarded as a feedback loop containing a DAC. The conversion process then corresponds to the transient oscillation of the loop. Successive approximation ADCs are intermediate in speed and accuracy and are widely used both in microcontroller systems and for digital signal processing. Converters with 8 to 18 bit resolution and conversion times of approximately 1 microsecond are commonly available. They are by far not as fast as the flash converters we have already seen, but typically faster than the very accurate Delta Sigma ADCs, which we will cover in our next video. So that's all for now. I'm Michael with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyway, thanks for watching. For further reference, we highly recommend the following two books. The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, which is very informative as well as entertaining. And for our German-speaking viewers, we recommend Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute. You can find the exact naming in the video description.